<clears throat> this reading is the first 13 verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, recommended reading. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, also al always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Have you ever noticed when you're thinking about a particular topic, you start seeing that topic everywhere? Or if you buy a car like a Honda, you start seeing Hondas everywhere. You buy a blue car, you see blue cars everywhere. That's what's been happening to me as I've been pondering this sermon. And I know how intimidating it must have been for Michael all these months to enter into a sermon series that is not of your own making. He's been talking about this, I want a church and what do we have as far as dreams for Colonial? And I was assigned this particular topic. We're reflecting on the idea of being a church that lives from the heart. The intersection of spirituality, mental health, and the care of our souls, you know, minor topics, right? Easy to fit in 10, 15 minutes. Hmm. So what does it mean to live from the heart? What I hear is that we are a church that seeks to foster our own well-being, as well as being a refuge for others to find connection and healing. A couple of weeks ago, driving home from worship, and I was reflecting on what Michael had said and how I could continue sort of this thread. And I had the radio on. I listened to NPR a lot, and the moth was on. And the story that was being told was from a guy who was a Muslim. Um, his family had gone to, uh, I think he was in London, from maybe Afghanistan, somewhere in there. And they still adhered to the idea of arranged marriages because their idea was that these arranged marriages lasted a lifetime, whereas the rest of us 
who choose love, we have a huge rate of divorce, right? So they said, this is the better way, and we want you to do this too. And this is contemporary times. So this man is growing up in this family where his parents never told him that they loved him. His sisters and brothers, however many there are, they never said, I love you to each other. So he spent this lifetime trying to intentionally figure out, what does love mean? And I thought it was kind of funny that he was looking at the music and lyrics of Bruce Springsteen and other artists. Like, what is he talking about? What is this love thing? And I was watching a movie. Mark and I are big Disney fans. So we were watching the newest movie to us called Wish. And I heard a quote in that movie that really resonated. It says, through the heart, we understand the world. And whether I like it or not, this really makes a lot of sense to me. No matter how much I can stay up in my head, which I do on a regular basis, maybe I want to, to protect my heart. No matter how much I try to do that, I still make sense of the world through my feelings, through my emotions, through my heart. And I see this in action at work a lot of the time. I'm a hospital chaplain. I see this quote in, in action where it says, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We recognize in our current time that many people are struggling with loneliness, depression, anxiety, isolation, and trying to find ways to connect with people, truly connect with people, despite the fact that we have opportunities all over the place to engage with others, we are still struggling with the motivation to show up in ways or places to make and build these strong connections. Attendance and volunteerism is down in all kinds of organizations, including the church. We live in a time where entire communities are losing faith with institutions and rejecting systems that have fallen short. Non-traditional third spaces, places like church, a gym, a park, coffee shop, places that are somewhere where you can be not at home and not at work. These places are growing in popularity, but we're still not making strong connections. We're just being there. So how can we create a third space within our church and our community that offers a safe and sacred place to land, to care for ourselves, to care for our souls, and to invite others into that as well. I was Googling love because, you know, what better place to start than uh, Google? <clears throat> and I saw a quote by Francis de Salle. Francis was a Catholic priest in 16th century France, and he was eventually canonized and recognized as a doctor of the church, and I love this title. His title was Doctor of Divine Love. He was known for his awareness of God's love, both to give it and to receive it, to demonstrate outwardly the love of God and to others, mirroring outwardly. And in response to a question of how to love God and neighbor more, he said this, you learn to love by loving, like flexing a muscle. And this is exactly what Paul was talking about in his letter in today's scripture, Corinth was this diverse group of people who had come together to, to be a church, to be a community. They had chosen this intentionally, but they were struggling as a community. And when is this scripture usually heard? Weddings. All right. Everybody's happy. There haven't been hardly any problems, or at least in theory, right? We're celebrating love. It's this giant, big, huge celebration, the pinnacle of love. But that's not what this scripture was actually talking about. The letter was written during a time of tension, diversity, of division, a lack of love within this church. So Paul's letter wasn't an attaboy for loving each other well. It was a letter of accountability and encouragement to do better. The diversity within the church of Corinth could have been such a blessing Within the church, there were working poor and upper class, people of power, families, widows, all kinds of people with spiritual gifts of differing kinds, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, all these persons who had said, we want to be together. And what a perfect vision for the idea of kingdom on earth. 
but it was fraught with discord, people choosing sides, bickering, going and choosing divisiveness rather than a unifying love of God and with one another. Our differences like this can contribute to challenging relationships and circumstances when we don't choose love and even self-sacrifice in elevating someone else's comfort over our own. Often in the hospital, I'm at, at meetings, and of course, as the chaplain, we are expected to offer a devotional or word of prayer. And I saw in this little prayer book a poem by Michael Lunig, who's actually a cartoonist, but he also has a book of prayers, and he said these words. There are only two feelings, love and fear. There are only two languages, love and fear. There are only two activities, love and fear. There are only two motives, two procedures, two frameworks, two results. Love and fear, love and fear. So this is a bit of a reductionist view, but it's really pretty true. And I heard after the fact that Michael talked a lot about this last week. I think I'm glad I didn't go back and have time to re, uh, review his message. I might have been a little intimidated. But earlier this year, we read that Brene Brown book, Atlas of the Heart. And in that book, she wanted to explore 87 feelings and emotions. And I don't know that I agree that all of them stem out of love and fear, but most of them do. There might be some nuances. And a lot of us were like, well, what's the point of that? This is just a dictionary of emotions. But what Brown was hoping to do was that by learning about emotions, establishing a common language and understanding of those emotions, we can choose to share our stories and our experiences in a way that is healing and transformative even or perhaps especially when they are difficult and it's really hard to share our vulnerability. Strong relationships are built on a, a foundation of shared transparency and Brown suggests that when we understand how and why our feelings show up in our bodies, we can become more curious about ourselves, our families, our communities, and how all of that might be connected. When we raise this awareness among all of us, we can then choose to intentionally look at our behaviors and respond to one another in community with love rather than react. We can learn to recognize when what someone has said triggers a past experience and we can avoid or overcome our knee-jerk reactions and choose instead to respond in loving ways. And there's a quote that Brene Brown had in her book that said something like this, when we feel lost or adrift in our lives, we often look to find answers in the distance on the shore, when truly that shore, that solid ground is right within us. Our anchor is connection, and we need first to connect with ourselves and with God or our higher power to make meaningful connection with others. The language that I use for that, that connection to ourselves and someone else is spirituality. And we hear over and over and over again about Jesus when he would get away from the crowds to pray. Before or after healing, preaching, teaching, feeding other people, he went away to the, to the mountain, to the garden, to connect with God. Another hear, thing we hear a lot of in, in the scriptures is, do not fear for I am with you. Over and over again, God says, do not fear. I think he knows that some of our default. But when we connect to our source of being, when we are immersed in the love of God, we can respond to the invitation to love ourselves and engage with others in love rather than in fear. And that's where our spiritual practices come in. We need to prioritize time for self-care, whether it's exercise, time in nature, music, connecting with our people, counseling, spiritual direction, prayer, journaling, whatever works for you. But that's the key. It has to work for you, not working for somebody else. I hate to journal. I try and try and try. 
once in a while, it really has a powerful impact. But I have 20, 30 books with a few pages filled in, right? If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. I love centering prayer, but not all people can connect with silence. So do what's right for you. And that's where we're going right now. Everyone's wondering what these little things are set up, especially if you missed worship like I did last week. Like, oh my gosh, is this something new? Nope, this is just today. We're going to take some intentional time and listen to a song to experience maybe a, a time of connection in a different way. So we have the kneeler up here, embodied prayer, sometimes a little bit different from sitting in a pew or silent prayer. Up here, I have some paper flowers, and you put the flower into the bowl of water with the petals side up, and just spend some time in reflection of how that flower blossoms and blooms, maybe what's opening up in you or what you'd like to see opening up in our church community. One is a candle lighting station at the back. I invite you to take a candle and light it in honor of someone or prayer for someone. And then on that side is a, another bowl of water with little pieces of paper that you can write on, a prayer, a burden, something that you'd like to let go of and put it in the water and see what happens. This is a way that we can make space for God to, to speak to us, to let us know that God is caring for us and walking alongside us. So I invite you, if you'd prefer, you could stay at your seat if you're uncomfortable, but I welcome you to this time of practice. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace And I am yours And you are mine Trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger 
in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name and leave my eyes above the waves rise my soul will rest in your embrace I am yours and you are Thank you. I wonder if that was an experience that anybody wanted to share. If not, that's okay too. In a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, it is said that the truly divine knowledge of God is that which is known by unknowing. And that's what spiritual practices invite us to, to connect to ourselves and our source of being in ways that are not necessarily tangible. And sometimes we only see the results over time and in subtle ways. This can create a framework or groundedness, even a sense of safety for connecting with others with their well-being in mind rather than our own. When we feel secure, we can better choose to be loving, like preparing to run a race, a marathon, a 5K. We have to practice and build up our stamina and perseverance in order to participate in community. We have to do the same thing. And there's really something to the idea that our experience or of seeing blue cars or the topic of love or Hondas, there's really something to that when we put out our focus and our intention and our energy focused on love, we're more likely to see it. We can focus and choose to look for hope, joy, and love, and kindness, or we can focus on fear and scarcity. And I know I've lived the focus on fear and scarcity. I wanna choose, I wanna choose love and possibility. I want to choose on the things I can do, even if I fall short, I want to choose on trying instead of just not trying at all. And as Colonial continues to discern our hopes for the future with our forthcoming interim pastor, we can choose to create a community on the foundation of love. I invite you to join me. Amen. <laughs>